Good afternoon, this time is good afternoon, and uh, welcome to the third and last presentation by Cesar Vidal. As I mentioned before, he is, uh, we are going to listen to one of the most important media person in Spain, and especially on the radio. Radio is, in where I'm coming from, extremely important, as uh, radio used to be here in this country. Cesar Vidal has written many books on different topics and uh, novels, history, religion, editorials, articles for newspapers. And um, his programs help us to create a political consciousness in Spain. And the main characteristic of any of his adventures has been to defends freedom of press and freedom of thinking and help people start thinking. And has always support democracy for decades, even when it meant to pay a price for that. So as I, you understand when I say he is a non-stop truth seeker. Regardless of the topic he covers, he is always a very passionate person, and we will see today when he speaks about the Inquisition. Everybody's ready? Okay, welcome Cesar Vidal. Well, I, I'm not sure that uh, to talk about the Inquisition is the best after luncheon, but anyway, well, we, we're going to, to go with this. Well, the Spanish Inquisition, it's a theme, it's an issue that uh, very controversial and very polemic. And I think there are different reasons to this controversy. First, the enemies, the foes of the Spanish Empire, have used during centuries the Inquisition like a kind of proof of the bloody and ruthless character and personality of the Spaniards. In the Spanish Inquisition was the proof of the barbarian uh, characteristic of the Spanish Empire. In, uh, in the other hand, the defenders of this Spanish Empire have tried to defend the Inquisition, telling that it was not as hard as the enemies th think, and in any way, any way, other peoples have done so bad, so much bad things like the people in the Spanish Inquisition. I think both sides are wrong. Of course, I, I don't think that the Spanish Inquisition has the monopoly of, of barbarian behavior. And I think you cannot excuse the Spanish Inquisition telling that there, there were other people uh, practicing torture. And this kind of argument is absurd. It's like to tell that, well, Auschwitz was not as bad as you can think, because, for example, Stalin sent uh, millions of people to the Gulag and they died there. Or to tell Stalin was not as bad as you can think, because it's, it's true that he murder millions of people, but Hitler to murder millions of people. I think the rational uh, way to, to view this problem is to tell, well, Stalin and Hitler were dictators, were ruthless dictators, and you cannot balance the wickedness of one of them with the wickedness of the other one. Uh, I have not the least intention of trying to excuse the mentality of the behavior of the Inquisition. I'm gonna try in the next minutes to expose the historical development of the Spanish Inquisition, to try to discover the true effect of the Spanish Inquisition in the Spanish society and its psychological and cultural impact till today of the Spanish Inquisition. Maybe we must begin our history in the year 385. Why? Well, it's very important. For the first time in the history of Christianity, in 300 
1885 was murder a person only because of his religious views. The man was named Priscilian, Pristiliano in Spanish. He was a Spanish bishop and he was a man who wanted to purify the corruption of the Christianity in the last years of the fourth century. Till then, well, some people were excommunicated some people were sent to the exile, but never the Christian authorities have murdered anybody because it was thought he was a heretic or an undisciplined person. Priscillian was the first. And this Spanish martyr has opened the road to murder people who are religious dissenters. Even so, from the death of Priscillian in the last years of the fourth century to the beginning of the Inquisition, would pass almost 1,000 years. Till the 13th century was not instituted the Inquisition. The reasons are very important. First, the Bishop of Rome has uh, a right to his target of being recognized, at least in the West, as the head of the Western Church. In the 13th century, in the first years of the, first of the 13th century, the last, uh, the last diocese in Milan recognized the primacy of the Bishop of Rome. Only one century before, the Bishop of Toledo in Spain had recognized also the primacy of the Bishop of Rome, so that the Bishop of Rome was the undiscussed head of the Western Church. The second reason was the preaching of the Cathars. They were a mystical movement in the south of France and north of Italy, and the biblical preaching of the Baldessias was not suffocated by the church authorities. So that, so that, in 1229 was created the Inquisition. This Inquisition was created only in the south of France and in the north of Italy to exterminate Cathars and Baldessians. But curiously, it was accepted in a very quick way by the King of Aragon, one of the monarchies uh, in Spain. In, concretely, the King James I exclude from the peace in Barcelona to every heretic and persons who receive the heretics. And this was the open road to the Inquisition. Still, the Inquisition was not established in Spain. And the reasons to the establishment of the Inquisition in Spain was given in the last years of the 14th century. In 1391, erupted in, in Spain a wave of pogroms, and they were terrible pogroms. They began in Seville, but they ran like uh, powder to the rest of Spain. The idea to the Jews was to choose between being converted to the Roman Catholic Church or to die. And when the pogroms of 1391 were over, a third part of the Jews had been murdered, a third part had been converted to the Roman Catholic Church, and a third part has survived in very difficult situation. To many persons, the idea is the Jews, Jewish communities in Spain began to die during these pogroms. The problem with the pogroms was that a third of the Jewish community in Spain had become Roman Catholic. Of course, most of them because of the fear to be sacrificed, and of course, people didn't believe that they were, they were sincere in their conversion. Of course, this was natural. If you had decided that you don't want to be murdered because you are Jew, and you become convert to the Roman Catholic Church, well, it was very possible that you are practicing in a secret way your faith of Jew, and it's possible that you are thinking about good times when you come back to the people of Israel. 
These new Christians were a real problem to the Roman Catholic Church, but I must tell that the problem has been created by the, the church itself. In the year 1461, the Franciscan Alonso de Espina begged uh, to the King of Castile, Henry IV, the creation of a general inquisition in the territories of the Crown of Castile. The idea is that there was a lot of false Catholics, of course, Jews or before Jews, and they must be discovered and punished. Henry IV was a weak king, but anyway, he was not disposed to create turmoil in the territories of the Crown of Castile and refused the idea of an inquisition in Castile. He accepted only an inquisition under the bishops and only in Toledo. The, the result was that many persons discovered that most of the Jews have assimilated. They were not hidden Jews practicing the faith of Israel, and the Inquisition is what not needed. But the problem was the a good part of these people coming from Jewish, Jewish faith were people more prepared, more educated, maybe more smart than the Roman Catholics. And they were competing now as new Christians, as new Catholics in the Christian society. It's incredible the way that these people coming from a Jewish faith, the way they got some of the best uh, places in the courts of Castile and Aragon. For example, in the crown of Aragon, the vice chancellor, the secretaries, the general bailiff, and the butler, lieutenant of the general treasurer, the governor of Aragon, the scribe of rations, the conservator of Aragon, or the secretary of commandments of justice were new Christians of Jewish origin. And of course, this create a lot of envy and a lot of resentment against the new Christians. In the case of the Crown of Castile, the situation was not different. For example, new Christians coming from Jewish road were councillors of the Crown, accountants of the Crown, bishops, and even the confessor himself of the Queen, Fray Hernando de Talavera, was a new Christian from Jewish origin. In this case, the idea was we must be war of the new Christians, most of them coming from Jewish origins. And this is the origin in Spain of the Inquisition. The 24th of October of 1478, Fray Alonso de Ojeda, a friar, uh, came to the kings in Cordoba asking for the creation of a Spanish Inquisition. The reason was that he said that he has discovered during the Holy Thursday in the Holy Week a group of six secret Jews that were practicing Judaism but telling that they were Catholics. Well, this must be very important because the kings accepted in 1479 uh, very few months after this episode to establish the Inquisition. And really, the Inquisition began to work very fast. In 1481, there was a wave of arrest of new Christians. And, for example, in the first days of February in this year, in front of Fray Alonso were burned six arrested Jews in the fields of Tablada, very close to Seville. And this, this way of burning was affecting clergymen, friars, and even dead people. Many corpses were unburied to be burned because it was discovered that they were secret Jews, even when they told that they were Catholics. In this same year, in 1481, the Queen Isabella proposed an Edict of Grace 
to the people who were Jews in a secret way, but they wanted to be reconciled into the Roman Catholic Church. Over 20,000 people accepted this edict. So that it was true that there were many secret Jews. And 11 February 1482, the Pope VI IV authorized to create a Supreme Council of the Inquisition in Spain. His third counselor was Fray Tomás de Torquemada, prior de Santa Cruz de Segovia. The wave of uh, arrest was truly incredible. And in one moment, some of the secret Jews, or simply new Christians, decided that the only way to stop the arrest and the, uh, final, the, the death penalty was to murder the, the most important inquisitor in Aragon, Pedro de Arbues. And really, Pedro de Arbues was murdered in Aragon, and this <laughs> unleashed a real wave of new persecutions against the new Christians of Jewish origin. During the rest of the years, the problem was only reduced when the Jews were expelled from Spain in 1492. The idea is with Jews expelled from Spain, well, the problem more or less will be assimilated within some years. It was not so. After the expulsion of the Jews, after the persecution of the new Christians, more of them coming from Jewish origin, in the 16th century, the new victims of the Inquisition were the Protestants. Some persons think that the real persecution against the Spanish Protestant was a, uh, a movement pushed by Philip II. The reality is the father of Philip II, Charles V, was the first person in persecuting Protestants in the north of Europe and also in Spain. To this time, it was very clear that the Inquisition was wanting to control the new Christians coming from Jewish, sometimes Moorish origins. Second, to support the view, the idea of the purity of blood so that no person coming from an ascent having a drop of blood, Jew, Moorish, Indian, or heretic can fulfill any employment. And third, to seed the terror in the society, paralyzing any dissidency of the Roman Catholic Church, and fourth, to exterminate any dissenter. Probably this use of the terror is the most specific note of the Spanish Inquisition. Nor torture, nor burning, but the use of the terror. Manuel Fernández Álvarez, maybe our best Spanish historian of the modern age, has told that the problem with the Inquisition was the use of the terror as a system. This is the terror as a systematic way of dealing with political and religious problems. And Fernández Álvarez uh, did right. And all this horror in the name of Christ. It's possible a uh, biggest contradiction. It was the technique of terror. The French Hispanist Bartolomé Benazar has written, they were trying to make sure the religious orthodoxy, the most strictest religious orthodoxies, by means of terror, the ideological immobilism. Nobody could dare not far to innovate, to criticize, to create any doubt. And to reach this target, the terror, was the surest mean. The inquisitors didn't want to be loved. They did want to be feared. Well, this uh, 
is really clear, and Fernandez Alvarez wrote also, we face, we face, we face without any doubt the biggest shadow of this age, the more fanatical shadow of the religious intolerance, the shadow of the inquisitorial fanatism. If this terror was suffered by the Spanish society, it was terribly used in a very special way against the Spanish Protestant. A good part of them were character of a big relevance. I'm going not to tell the history of the Spanish Protestant. I, I feel tempted, but <laughs> I, I cannot do this. But, for example, the names of people who were murdered or who were obligated to exile because of the Inquisition is really interesting. For example, the first writer in Spain before Miguel de Cervantes was Juan de Valdés. Juan de Valdés is a person almost unknown in Spain because he was a religious dissenter, but he was a real genius. And of course, he was exiled from Spain because he was advised that the Inquisition was proposing a trial against him. Valdés was a, a real genius. He was uh, against, as Cervantes, and we say in the last lecture, against the idea of the purity of the blood. He wanted a reformation of the church coming back to the New Testament, and at last he fled to Italy. It's very curious that several years ago, Antonio Forcellino, one of the most important historians of the, of the Italian Renaissance, has discovered that Michelangelo Buonarroti was a disciple of the Spanish Juan de Valdez. Not only this, Michelangelo was a kind of secret Protestant, and you can only understand the Sistine Chapel if you knew that he was a, a real dissenter, but this would be too long. The lack of other Spanish Protestant was atrocious. For example, in 1546, Juan Diaz published his Summa of, of the Christian Religion, and he was murdered by his own brother Alfonso, a fanatic Catholic who cannot support the idea of having a heretic into the family. Jaime de Encinas, another of the Spanish humanists, also a Protestant, was burnt in Roma. The brother of Jaime, it's an incredible character. I, I myself wrote a novel about him, Francisco de Encinas, was more lucky he could escape from the Spanish Inquisition, and at last he translated the first translation from Greek to Spanish, the New Testament. He was a professor of ancient Greek in Cambridge, and he died in the exile, and he was lucky. The Inquisition never put his hands upon him. But other Protestants were not as lucky as Francisco de Encinas. Philip II, the king that Geoffrey Parker has defined as the imprudent king, was uh, watching the first auto da fe against Spanish Protestant. It was in Valladolid, the Sunday 28th of May of 1559. And it's curious because when the Protestants were taken to be burned, Philip II said, if my own son would be one of you, I would brought the boot to be burned. So that his ideas about the goodness of the Inquisition were very clear. There is this, this same year of 1555, 59, there were also autos de fe in Seville, again in Valladolid, and of course in the following years in, in towns like Calahorra, Valencia, Zaragoza, Córdoba, Cuenca, Granada, Murcia, Llerena, or Toledo. In, in some cases, the Inquisition was mock, was escaped, because the Spanish Protestants were quicker than the action of the Inquisition. For example, in 1557, 
a group of Spanish monks that were living in a monastery in Seville began to read the Bible without any second intention. They were wanting only to read the Bible. And reading the Bible, they became Protestants. Two of them, Casiodoro de Reina and Cipriano de Valera, decide to fly from Spain. They fly from Spain the same day, the same hour, in different directions. Reina and Valera translate the Bible from Hebrew and Greek to the Spanish, and they wrote the most important and published translation of the Bible to the Spanish in all the history, the Bible of Reina and Valera that is still published. The problem is the Catholic king have expelled from Spain the Jews, the Inquisition had rubbed the Protestantism from Spain, and these two decisions will, would have a very important weight in the history of Spain and not in a very positive way. I'm going not to, to talk very much about the way the Inquisition trying to, perpet uh, to make perpetual, to make eternal, the social division based upon the purity of blood or uh, how it persecute the humanist. Antonio de Nebrija, Miguel Servet, Francisco de Vergara, Juan Luis Vives, even future Catholic saints as Juan de la Cruz, Ignacio de Loyola, Teresa de Ávila, etc., were persecuted by the Inquisition. But today it's impossible to deny that the Inquisition make a real wound in the Spanish soul. For example, Ángel Alcalá, a Catholic author who has been professor of several Catholic seminaries in Spain, has written that the Inquisition could make very clear the lines who separate the Orthodox from the heterodox, but at the same time, murder the spiritual spontaneity and its free literary expression. And this is very clear. Probably the worst tribute of the Inquisition was not the use of the torture of the number of physical victims, but the creation of a culture of terror that appealed to Christ to apply everyone, every time, and everywhere. The inquisitors, faithful servants of the Roman Catholic Church, wished to seed the terror. And the historical sources are very clear. For example, in 1578, Francisco Peña, uh, publishing the, the handbook of inquisitors, Manual de Inquisidores, uh, written by Nicolau Ekmeric, wrote the same, this. We must remember that the first target of the trials and of the death penalty is not to save the soul of the accused, but serve the public good and terrorize people ut ali terreantur, in Latin. There is not any doubt that terrorized people with the proclamation of the condemnations is a good action. The idea was very clear. The Roman Catholic Church was not searching the spiritual goodness of the victim, was searching to use this victim to diffuse the terror among the masses. And this terror was considered a good action. Of course, the means were very important. The first mean was the torture. Uh, the problem with the torture was not itself the use of the torture. The torture was very common in this age, and it was, it was used by church and civil authorities. The problem was the kind of torture the inquisitors were using. For example, they made many innovations in the field of tortures. And it's very interesting that the Spanish parliament, the Spanish courts, in many occasions asked not the abolition of the Inquisition, 
but the no innovation in, in the ways of torture. And this was very repeat in Aragon in 1510, 1512, and 1519, in Catalonia in 1515, in Castile in 1518. The idea is, please don't use new inventions of torture. It's, it's enough with the tortures we know till now. And, of course, I'm going not to describe the different kinds of torture. The tortures of the Inquisition were not applying, applied to everybody in the same way. For example, Protestants and Jews were tortures always in a systematic way. In the Kingdom of Aragon, to the Protestants and secret Jews, were at the people who were suspect of homosexuality, of having sexual relations with animals. But, and this is very important, the torture was never applied to priests who tried to have sexual relations with women. They were some of us. Second, and this is very important, the torture was frightening, but the, the other condemnations were even more frightening. For example, before 1930, the proportion of sentence to the capital penalty was very high. After uh, 1530, there were two very concrete times where this kind of condemnations would rise. For example, the first was when Philip II decided to exterminate every Spanish Protestant. The second, when in the crown of Arago decided to exterminate homosexuals and people having sexual relations with animals. And the third was between uh, 1648 and 1660, when after the fall of El Conde Duque de Olivares, he was the first minister, so-called, of Philip IV, there was a real hunting of people who could be secret Jews. And the problem is these were three peaks in the practice of the death penalty, but the death penalty didn't disappear after these three ages. For example, the Inquisition uh, was burning people during the 18th century and even in the 19th century was murdered the last victim of the Inquisition. He was a school teacher, his name was Cayetano Ripoll, and his uh, felony was to be Protestant. Anyway, anyway, the most frightening in the actions of the Inquisition probably were not neither torture nor the death penalty. What inspired more terror and more fear to the victims of the society and, of course, to the Spaniards was three things that Bartolome Benazar has underlined. First, the secret. Second, the memory of the infamy. And third, the threat of misery. The secret was uh, really horrible because it was impossible to know exactly which was your accusation. You were arrested by the Inquisition, but you did not know why or which persons have informed about you. This was really terrible because the dilation, the informers, were people who deserve in spiritual indulgence. And this was a kind of guarantee of eternal salvation. The false witness, and this is very important, never were punished. And they were not punished because the informers were needed by the Inquisition. And of course, the proportion of condemnations was very high. For example, in Valencia, between 1478 and 1530, 
there was only 12 absolutions in 1,862 sentences. This is 0.65%. The rest, of course, were condemned. The second reason for terror was the extension of infamy to the uh, relatives of the person who has been a victim of the Inquisition. Sometimes this was through a kind of public penitence, for example, wearing special clothes, but it was also the fact that they had not purity of blood. The sons, the grandsons, the grand-grandsons, forever and ever, were people without purity of blood. So that they cannot go to America, they cannot practice works like medicine or to be butcher, they cannot wear clothes of silk or jewels, they cannot wear arms, they cannot ride even upon a mule, they cannot have public functions, they cannot be priests or friars, forever and ever. And this is very important. I, I want to, to tell you a case that illustrates what mean to have not purity of blood. Cristobal Rodriguez was a kind of functionary in the town of Los Santos. Rodriguez was denounced to the Inquisition for being the son and the grandson of people who had been condemned by the Inquisition. Rodriguez, of course, wanted to keep to himself the purity of blood. And, of course, if he was the son and grandson of people condemned by the Inquisition, he would lose the purity of blood. Rodriguez could save himself. Why? Telling that his mother has confessed to him that he has had adultery relations with a Christian that was not a new Christian. So that to be a son of a whore was much better with the Inquisition that to be the son of a heretic. And this is very, I think, this, this sheds a lot of light to understand this. And of course, the third mean of terror was the ruin of the person and of his uh, relatives. And in this case, a person who was arrested by the Inquisition could see his goods totally confiscated and many times he must leave the town where he was living and it was not very easy to create a new life in other side and without money. In this case, and this is very important, probably, probably, the worst in the actions of the Inquisition was the memory of the shame. If your father, your grandfather, your grand-grandfather sometime was arrested by the Inquisition, this taint was falling upon you forever and ever. But probably the most important in the history of Inquisition are not the fires, are not the arrest, are not the tortures, but the way that the Inquisition modeled the Hispanic, the Spanish mentality. The weakness in front of the terror, the fondness for the delation, the rewards offered to people who delayed their neighbors even falsely, the ideological process without any processal guarantee, the infamy that was shed upon people and the sons of the people and the grandsons of the people, the ruin of the people considered the dissenters, or the memory of the infamy, are terrible behaviors that were called to repeat in the history of Spain, I must say, in the history of the Latin America, 
during the next centuries. And I think, and I think this is the worst heritage of the Spanish Inquisition, this kind of behavior, even today, had not been extirpated from the national Spanish soul in a total way. And of course, it had been not extirpated for the Latin American soul. And, well, this is not so difficult of understanding. During half millennium, almost half millennium, the most important cultural influence, the influence coming from the Roman Catholic Church, was teaching that acting in this way, behaving in this way, was a guarantee of material and social rewards, and also a guarantee of eternal salvation. So that we cannot sur be surprised if this characteristic, life like a kind of damnation, has been happening since then to both sides of the Atlantic. The only hope to the future is to discover the reality of the Inquisition, and not only the controversies about the Inquisition, to see how this has affected the roots of nations at both sides of the Atlantic, and to try to solve the problems that the actions of the Inquisition have created during almost 500 years. And we must be hopeful. Thank you very much. And now, if you have any question, and nobody's going to lose the purity of blood. <laughs> This, this is, no, I, I think this is a very good question. I'm not sure the answer is going to be so good, but, well, I have dedicated almost a third of one of my last books to this question, but I, I'm going to try to be synthetic. Uh, well, I think this is a tragic heritage to Spain a good part of the countries in Southern Europe, and of course to Latin America, and this in, includes Mexico, but Argentina or Peru, etc. And the problems are different problems. For example, the, the view of the Counter-Reformation and the Spanish Inquisition is a good part of this view of the Counter-Reformation is a view that has not many points that had been developed in the Europe or in North America where the Reformation has won the ideological battle. For example, one of them is the imperium, the supremacy of the law, not of the institution, of the law. Uh, let me give you an example. In one moment, the people who live in Genève, in Switzerland, decide to expel John Calvin from Genève. They were very tired of the reformist. He was very hard, so that they decide to expel him. And this situation uh, was used by a cardinal, the Cardinal Savoletto, to write a letter to the people in Genève to come back to Roman Catholic Church. And the argument of the Cardinal Sadoletto was, well, the most important is the institution. You must come back to the right institution, that is the Roman Catholic Church. 
The people of Geneva have expelled Calvin, but they thought, well, maybe the only person who can answer back Calvin, uh, who can answer back Cardinal Sadoleto is Calvin. And Calvin, in two days only, wrote back an answer. I'm going not to talk about the theological questions in, in the answer of Calvin, but the, the idea of Calvin is the most important thing is not the institution, is the law. And the law is over the institution. And if the institution is not under the law, has not legitimacy. These are two views very different in North of Europe and North of America and South of America and South of Europe. Because the idea with a British, a Norwegian, or an American is the law is over the institutions. The institutions must be under the law. And if, for example, the President of the United States is attacking the law, he can be impeached. And sometimes he must leave. For example, Richard Nixon. But the idea in the other countries is the institution is over the law. Like the Roman Catholic Church is over the Bible. So that this means that in the south of Europe or in Central and South of America, the institution generally is over the law. No president is impeached. Well, sometimes there is a coup d'etat and they must fly. But no president is impeached. And of course, the presidents think that they are over the law. And this is real in Mexico, in Argentina, in Spain. So that this is the first difference. And this difference was enforced by the Inquisition. Not only by the Inquisition, but it's one of the things. Another difference is the idea of an absolute power that can be good against the idea of checks and balance. To the people in the north of Europe or north of America, and they were people instructed by the Bible, the human being as a collective of in an individual way are fallen beings. Every one of us are sinners, make mistakes, and we feel a kind of inclination to evil. So that if you want to fall not into tyranny, we must separate the different powers and have a system of checks and balance. Because the absolute power is going to go to tyranny. But the idea in the Counter-Reformation Europe and in South America, and of course the Inquisition was supporting this, is of course there are absolute powers that are good. The only thing is that they must be good. Sometimes the name of the absolute power that is good is Fidel Castro. Or sometimes it's Hugo Chavez. Or sometimes it's another person, but of course there are absolute power that are good. The Pope and the Emperor are absolute powers and they are good. And this, is, this makes a very good difference between these two cultures. And I think that, well, I, I could be talking about this all day in the afternoon and I, I want to be compassionate toward you, you but uh, other is the use of the lie. According to the Roman Catholic uh, theology, the lie is a venial sin. So that this is a kind of not so important thing. So that we can use the lie uh, to good targets. And for example, if one of the informer is informing falsely about this person, well, this is not so important because the peace of the society is guaranteed even by liars. 
But in the other part of the world, when the Reformation won the battle, the lie is as seen as adultery or murder or thief. So that in a part of the world where the lie is very important, the political career of a politician can be ruined if he has lied. In the other part of the world, nobody has lost an election by lying. I do not know about any politician in Spain, in Italy, in Portugal, in Argentina, in Mexico, or in Guatemala, etc., 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 who has destroyed his political career by lying. And, well, this is a result. And I think there are many more results. For example, the scientific development, the investigation of culture, etc., uh, that are very related to the legacy of Inquisition. But I think this would be too long, and Susanna is, is advising me. Thank you very much.